so my daughter, Saxon, shits her pants. Every Sunday morning, we go to a bakery called Moxie Bread in Louisville, Colorado. It's like 15 minutes east of Boulder. So we get up on Sunday, we get dressed, we brush our teeth, we jump in the car, and we drive. Now, as soon as we get in the car, the first thing that happens is Saxon says, Alexa, play Beauty and the Beast soundtrack. Oh, Alexa in the car. So I put on Beauty and the Beast soundtrack, and we sing Be Our Guest four times on the way. Louisville is like this idyllic small town. Main Street is just a couple of blocks of shops and restaurants. And when you open the car door, you smell freshly baked bread and brewing coffee. There's always a line. And in COVID times, their pastry case is behind this huge pane window. And I live Saxon up so she can pick out what she wants. And this morning, she chooses a cruffin, which is like a muffin croissant hybrid. It's like an X-Man pastry. It's serious stuff. So we're sitting outside. The sun is shining. And I'm just watching an avalanche of pastry jars and cinnamon sugar fall down her front. She's so happy. We walk four blocks to the playground. And when she sees the playground, she gets hyped. She starts giggling. She starts chattering. She has this hoppy skip step that she does. She runs across the playground, runs to the top of the slide, and gives me a look. I know this look. It looks as if all of the joy in the world has suddenly evaporated. And so I lift her up and I pat her bottom. And sure enough, a tragedy has occurred. So I'm carrying her back and I feel the her head on my shoulder. And she's sad, probably a little embarrassed. And so I say, sweetie, don't sweat it. We're going to go home, new outfit, new playground, you and me. We got this. And so we go home. Zero clothing is salvageable. So it's top to bottom change. And back out to a new playground. This time, it's behind an elementary school, and it's a paradise. There's like four huge, distinct play areas on this massive bed of soft mulch. And the sun is beating. The air smells like warm wood. And same thing, she sees the playground, she gets geeked, she runs across, goes to the top of the slide, and she her pants again. I kind of died on the second one. That one hurt. So I lift her down, and I'm holding her hand. We're doing like this sad walk across the playground. I put her in the car seat, and I get in the car. And I look in the rearview mirror. And I see her beautiful blue eyes. And I said, Saxon, I'm not mad. I'm just really sad that we didn't get to play at the playground. I know how much you love that. And she smiled and said, it's OK, Daddy. I always knew I would be a father. I didn't know that I would struggle with being a father as much as I have. Before Saxon was born, I did everything I could to make sure that we had a great relationship. Six months off of work, I scratches, changed diapers, I got involved. We went on adventures. We road tripped from Chicago to California. And the whole time, there was distance between us that I just didn't know what to do with it. For my entire adult life, it had been, I'm responsible for my actions. I'm accountable for my actions. And now my actions didn't do anything. And I couldn't will my ship. I felt lost. And more than that, when I had time to speak with family and friends, it was the last thing I wanted to talk about. Shame is pretty low on the totem pole of where you So I said nothing. But over time, that story just kind of ate away at me from the inside. So I was living in Chicago, Illinois at the time, which is home to the second city. 
It's a famous improv theater. And they offered storytelling classes. And I was like, God, just let me get this story out of my body. So I signed up. So I go to these storytelling classes. And my first attempts were um, sub-awesome. Let's go with that. I basically just scraped all the black gunk I had in my body and dropped it on the floor for everyone to stare at. I didn't feel any better. And I don't think anyone listening particularly enjoyed the experience either. But then one night, we had a substitute teacher. And her name is Jess Mitolo. And I finished telling my story about Saxon. And Jess said, and I quote, that's a beautiful story but you're telling it all wrong. Just help me understand that the best stories happen at the intersection of objective and subjective storytelling. If a story is objective, all facts, all black and white, there's no room for the listener to breathe in the story to become a part of it. On the subjective side, some mess. It's emotions and loud noises and bright colors. It's powerful but it's unwieldy. You can't get a part of that either. But if you can take that mess and hold it with the care of an objective observer, amazing things can happen. The first thing I noticed is that the body language of the people I spoke to changed. I could watch as their chest and their shoulders and their eyes would rise and fall with the drama of the story. And when I was finished, they had so many questions. Well, what were you thinking in that moment? Well, how the hell did that happen? Would you do the same thing again? And my answer most of the time was, I don't know, or I don't remember. But when I sat with those questions and I sat with those stories, these new details would emerge. And I went from painting in black and white to having an artist palette to work with. I had a story that I was a bad father. But I found a moment that allowed me to write an entirely new chapter of my life. One night when Saxon was about two months old, I was up overnight with her. She was screaming. Now, before I had a baby, no one explained to me that humans are born before they're biologically ready to defend themselves. And what I mean by that is we have these big, stupid heads with our big, stupid brains. And if we were born any later, the mother would likely die in childbirth. So instead, we have developed a whale. We've all been on an airplane. That sound makes you wanna jump out of your own skin and run for the hills. And Saxon had been at it for three or four hours. And I did everything that I knew to do. She was dry. She was warm. She was fed. I tried talking to her. I tried walking around with her. I tried this crazy rocking thing I learned from a nurse at the hospital. I tried shh, shh, shh. Nothing. So finally, in an act of desperation, I took her and I just wedged her into a boppy, which is like a three-quarter donut pillow situation. If you know anyone with a baby, they have seven, I promise you. And so she's just sitting there. And I look at her beautiful blue eyes. I said, sweet baby. My baby. My perfect little lady, I love you. But I'm going crazy on the daily. I know that I'm not perfect. My record is checkered. I'm trying to make amends. I'm trying to correct it. But I did all the things. I checked every checklist. At this rate, your dad not making it to breakfast. I don't mean to push. I don't mean to impose. But maybe, baby, you could let those eyelids close. She stopped. And so I scooped her up and I felt the weight of her head hit my shoulder. And to this day, nothing in the world makes me feel more loved. After that class, 
I hired that woman Jess as my director. She helped me write and produce two storytelling shows that I performed around Chicago, including a run of four performances at Second City in March of 2020. The first show, y'all are good. The first show was buoyed by friends and family. They made an awful lot of noise in a small theater. The second show, we sold out. We filled the room. And the third show was canceled, as was the fourth. For most of 2020, I tried performing the show on Zoom. I tried online stand-up. I tried open mics. I joined writing groups. I did everything I could to fill this void I felt from not doing this, being on stage. And nothing worked. I felt like I was losing all this momentum. I felt like I was wasting my time. I felt like a crazy person trying to find some semblance of normalcy in the middle of a global pandemic with a 24-hour news cycle. And I spent more time with my family than I have in a decade. I wrote hundreds and hundreds of pages. I found a new home base for connection. I got so good at making cocktails. <laughs> and more than all of that, I ended up on this stage, on this night, with all of you. I love that story. There isn't a single person in this room who had the 2020 that she anticipated. Routine was ripped from our grasp and we're still putting the pieces back together. But my question to you is, will you tell your story? Will you hold your mess with the care of an objective observer? Will you put your truth into the world? I hope you do. I can't wait to hear it. Thank you.